All right, welcome everyone. Hi everyone, uh, it's nice to see you. We've got quite a few people signed up today, so um, I imagine people will be coming in dribs and drabs in the next couple of minutes. Um, but welcome to the October event in our Scholars Library series. Um, for those who haven't been here before, um, each month this initiative allows an, a scholar alum to come and talk about their literary works to those within the Rose community and also those outside of it. Um, and today we're really excited to welcome Carl. And Carl's here to talk about his book, Rewired, Protecting Your Brain in the Digital Age, which ironically we are holding on Zoom. Um, I'm sure you all noticed that. Um, and Ali's here to moderate the conversation. He's a third year DPO student in biomedical engineering. Um, so I won't talk for much longer because you've not come here for me, but I will post the link to purchase Carl's book in the chat um, and hand over to Ali. He'll give you a further introduction to Carl and the session and we can get right into it. So please feel free to post any questions you might have along the way in the chat as we go and we can fit them into the Q&A section at the end. So over to you, Ali. All right. Thank you, Georgie. So... Today, we're going to be discussing the book Rewired, Protecting Your Brain in the Digital Age with Carl. So first of all, just a brief introduction about Carl. So Carl is a physician, scientist, entrepreneur, and the author of the book, Rewired, Protecting Your Brain in the Digital Age. So he's currently the chief psychiatrist and managing director of the mental health and neuroscience at OM OM1, a health technology and data company based in Boston, Massachusetts. He is a board certified psychiatrist at MGH and a part-time assistant professor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School. In this book, he uses a combination of behavioral and neuroscience informed models, as well as anecdotes to show us how news media, communications and digital forms of social interactions are altering us at a physiological level, leading to attention deficits, loss of emotional control, and other executive, executive function deficits, and also implications in our physiological health, mental health, even reducing our capacities for empathy, social judgment, and increasing narcissistic tendencies. And personally for me, when I was reading this book, it more or less felt like an, a biography or an autobiography for me in many times, many times, because I was guilty of so many of the practices that as I've read and I became more informed have such an impactful uh, and deleterious effects on my life and on my health. But before discussing the book, um, I wanted to talk about social bonds, which is a recurring theme in Carl's books and ask Carl, you refer to multiple types of bonds and social connections, ones that begin from birth with parents and their caregivers and continue with friends, lovers, families, as well as bonds even like such as the ones between patients and their um, therapists or their doctors and healers. And I was wondering why are such, why do friendships and bonds that form digitally or online not sufficient to replicate those real life social relationships? And perhaps you could allude to some of the physiology behind such a discrepancy. Yeah, great. Th thanks, uh, Ali, uh, for the introduction and, and welcome, everyone. Um, so, you know, I think the core premise of the book, uh, and there are many themes, but the, the core premise is that we are wired uh, to connect with one another. Um, and that connection, which is so important, and we'll talk about it in a moment, um, is being disrupted. Right. So let's go to the core of your question, which is uh, why, why, why do I say we're wired to connect? Well, the human brain at birth uh, is uh, one of the only species on the planet uh, for which only 10 percent of development occurs in the womb. So 90 percent of neurodevelopment occurs outside of uh, the womb uh, and 90 percent is a long a lot. Number one. Number two, if you think about it, society says, at least, uh, you know, in, in the U.S., uh, uh, around the age of 18, uh, you can be emancipated and go on your own and you can vote and go to war and, and do all kinds of things. Um, you know, that's a long time, 18 years, right? So it's not surprising in that context, right? A very vulnerable brain at birth that requires, you know, uh, upwards of two decades to develop um, that uh, someone would have to come along uh, and, and someone did come along and, and take care of all of us. 
Um, and that in order to do that uh, over time, over the periods of, of years and, and, and decades, um, we would have evolved to have networks of neurons in our brains to form st strong social bonds. Um, and so, so that's sort of the, the why um, that in order to survive as, as a species, um, that's required. Uh, now, over time, uh, what happens is those uh, bonds, which uh, you know, between caregiver and child uh, also evolve, involve friendships, um, loved ones, uh, partners uh, in business, uh, in, in, in all spheres of our lives um, that we connect with. And uh, I talk about in the book, uh, Robin Dunbar's work. Um, and, you know, he, he's a fascinating uh, character, uh, an anthropologist turned neuroscientist who looked at across species, certain um, areas of the brain as a correlate to the size of the social network that that species could handle, right? And, uh, a lot of science and, and a lot of studies went into essentially showing uh, the ratio of the across species, the ratio of the, the, the neocortex to the subcortex was a very good proxy of social network size. And then he went and looked within humans and said, well, within humans, there's some variability, right? Some of us have larger social networks than others, um, but it's constrained, right? You, you can only get so big. Uh, and, and, uh, and this is what's called uh, the, the Dunbar number of about 150. So you look across society and around 150 people, militaries are organized that way. Companies require more management structures. Uh, most churches, uh, besides mega churches, have around 150, 200 people. Um, and it turns out to be about the size of a, of a social cohort uh, or network that we can kind of reasonably know enough about uh, a, another person uh, to maintain some form of connection. Um, now, what's really interesting about his work, and I think important to the book, uh, is that the variance is around 50. So the Dunbar number of 150 is, is really somewhere between 100 and, 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 and 200. Um, and what determines whether you're closer to 100 or closer to 200 um, is the size of a particular part of the prefrontal cortex, the orbital frontal cortex, which is primarily responsible for emotion regulation. Um, and so the bigger that area, in other words, the, the more we're able to emotionally uh, regulate ourselves, take information from our emotional world, informs uh, our empathy and our social bonds, the larger that network can be. Um, so that's where the, the physiology comes in. And you, you mentioned that. So my academic work uh, years ago was on the, the, the physiology and neurobiology of empathy. You know, how does one brain understand an, another brain? And uh, my big idea at the time was that uh, um, we were too busy from a neuroscience perspective focused on an individual's brain, right? I just made the case that we're social creatures and we're constantly bonding with each other and that's required for us to survive as a species. So, so the idea of a social neuroscience, um, uh, and I was the first director of social neuroscience at, at Mass General, um, was this idea that we could study the brains of two individuals interacting. And you can't do that in a brain scanner, because if you've ever been in a fMRI machine, you know, big, big machine makes a lot of noise, you're in this little tunnel, uh, it's kind of hard to have a meaningful social interaction. Um, so, so the idea was to try to do something naturalistic and use physiologic measures, right? So measuring heart rate and skin conductance, the body's manifestation of emotion uh, as a proxy for what was going on in the brain from two people simultaneously. So I literally would run around the, the clinic and try to recruit uh, uh, clinicians and their patients to allow me to videotape uh, psychotherapy sessions and, and wire people up. And what I found was that there were moments in those interactions uh, that uh, showed a kind of concordance or synchrony in their physiology. So imagine two people talking, 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 and then all of a sudden it starts to go like this, talking, talking, talking. Ooh. And if you look at those moments when their physiology is literally aligned, they were very uh, emotional and, and you could literally feel from the videotape that, 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 that there was an empathic moment. And, and I did correlations between the more those moments occurred, the more the patient would rate the therapist as empathic. Now, flash forward a few decades, others have found brain synchrony between two people, heart rate synchrony to, between people, all kinds of uh, physiologic synchrony. So, so not only are we wired to connect, when we now understand that part of that connection is occurring on a non-conscious level, in a way that we can kind of resonate with each other. And just like you and I are shaking our head right now, sometimes mirror each other um, in, in a form of understanding. And that's how one way we communicate. I so 
so you can see how it starts to get disrupted from there. And I guess you mentioned that this is mediated by the prefrontal cortex, which I remember you used a really nice analogy. You said it's the conductor of neuronal symphonies. Yes. Uh, and it basically orchestrates whatever happens in the brain by connecting all the regions together. However, you mentioned that the prefrontal cortex actually becomes compromised in yes. such excessive use of digital media. And I guess, first of all, it's worth mentioning what the prefrontal cortex does in layman words. You know, you mentioned it does put break on thoughts or behaviors that may seem inappropriate. In other words, it prevents us from luring purely into our reward system. And as we've seen, you know, interactions like, as, as you have mentioned, social interaction, uh, digital interactions do not replace social interactions and they place a strain on the prefrontal cortex. As you know, you mentioned in your book, the mere presence of a smartphone on a table, even if it's not yours, could significantly disrupt what you get out of a relationship or what you get out from a face-to-face -face interaction. Nonetheless, smartphones do not only affect our interaction, they also affect our performance. You talk about multitasking and you say that adults and teenage alike, me included, guilty, we have some form of an inflated sense of productivity. Yet you cite many studies, both longitudinal and also the meta-analysis sort of type that show otherwise, that show we're basically doing nothing when you're multitasking. And I was wondering, why is this the case? Why are you not productive when you're multitasking? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so let's let's talk a bit about the prefrontal cortex and then multitasking, right? So, as you say, I use this uh, metaphor of the uh, prefrontal cortex as a conductor in our neuronal symphonies. Um, other metaphors are the prefrontal cortex is the CEO of the business of the brain. Um, uh, sometimes uh, people have used the metaphor of the um, the chariot rider, right? The prefrontal cortex is the the charioteer, and and you've got the the horse uh, uh, that is both the emotion and the reward centers trying to rein them in, right? All these kind of work. I, I like the uh, conductor metaphor because um, it allows you to sort of play out instruments, and the instruments uh, are the different regions of your brain. Um, so, so let's talk about multitasking. So one of the, so flash forward uh, from my doing this empathy research with patients and doctors to uh, starting a company called Interscope Research, which is a pioneer in the field of consumer neuroscience. So I go from social neuroscience to consumer neuroscience. So now instead of two brains interacting, we've got groups of brains, <laughs> audiences reacting to media and marketing, right? So we're literally wiring up entire audiences watching the Super Bowl or watching commercials, doing all kinds of stuff, looking at synchrony on an audience level. Because it turns out, that while we do have this powerful network of neurons that allows us to connect with one another as humans, we connect with all kinds of things, including brands, products, and services, and technology, right? Which is really important here because we can get equally infatuated with some of the content in, in the uh, apps on, on this device as we can with um, our loved ones. Um, and that's, that's where things start to go sideways. Uh, as, as we can discuss. Um, but what I learned as we were doing some studies of, of people literally in the real world, so we would give them spy glasses, so they're glasses like this, that had a little camera. So it's a day in the life, we could see exactly what people could see. We gave them heart rate monitors, and then we would code every second throughout the day. And we found uh, a bunch of things, but one of the things that was really odd is that people really didn't spend much time looking at one thing or another when they were like watching TV, they'd be looking at a newspaper or they'd be at work and they're looking at their screen and then they look at their, uh, their iPad or their phone, or they'd be you know, uh, on their phone and then talking to someone and going back and forth. And we said, wow, that's, that's really interesting. That looks like a, a kind of a task switching. Um, maybe we could develop an index of a media attention span, right? And so uh, media multitask. So multitasking is just the idea of you're trying to do two or more things simultaneously. Media multitasking is one of those things or both is a, is a media platform. And it could be traditional media like television, radio, newspaper, magazines, or new media, which is anything connected to the internet, smart TV, tablet, iPad, computer, laptop, smartphone, in, in all combinations. So we did something very simple. We just sort of tracked how often this happened. And what we realized is that it was happening an awful lot. Younger people were doing it more than older people. Um, and it started to look like people did it because we had the physiology when they got bored. Mm 
right? And, and we started to do other studies in other environments and this, this started to repeat itself over and over again, that we, that we use media to regulate our emotions. And what I mean by that is basically when we get bored, we start grabbing something. And even when we're on this platform, we can switch applications when one gets boring or another uh, gets boring. And what that drives is uh, an awful lot of media consumption, right? So, so that, that publicly traded company you and I were talking about earlier as we were preparing um, was a company called Nielsen. It was a big ratings company. They bought this consumer neuroscience company. Um, and I had uh, access to television ratings from all over the world. And we started to look at uh, various things. But you look at adults in the US um, media consumption across all platforms from roughly 2001 to 2018, um, we, Americans went from about uh, 30 to 40 hours a week, almost a full-time job consuming media um, to over 80 hours. Yeah. How in the world does the average adult in this country, the US, consume nearly two full-time jobs of media, 80 plus hours, 11 hours a day in some service. Well, the only way you can do that is when you're you know, in the elevator or on the bus or you find time to consume because the media goes with us. But the other way you do it is you're doing two things at once, right? The TV's on and you're in front of your computer, right? And, and Nielsen double counts that, right? Well, you watch an hour of TV, but you also had an hour on your smartphone. Oh, okay, there's two hours. But what are the consequences of doing that? And why do we do it so much to, to, to your question, right? So study after study after study after study after study after study after study shows that we are really not good at multitasking. Um, and that all we do is increase our error rate and slow down our processing. So we make more mistakes and we go slower. The question is, why do we all do it? And I do it too. It's, it's one of these brain tricks, right? So we've all learned growing up that the harder you work, the more productive you are. Yeah. So it feels like you're working hard because you're doing two things at once and you are working harder. It doesn't mean you're working smarter. And so it's very rewarding. You get finished like, oh my God, I'm so productive. I just watched TV and answered a bunch of emails, right? Well, all you really did was probably screw up half of those emails and you missed half of the show. Um, but you felt good because you were doing two things at once. You see the point? I guess you, it, it does tax our prefrontal cortex and we associate such taxation with productivity and job being done, but this is not the case, I guess. That's right. And, and I, I talk about this in the book for the neuroscience geeks in the crowd, right? So there was a big debate about well, why do we have um, all, all these problems with multitasking? Is it because the prefrontal cortex is trying to recruit uh, the percussion section to do what the, the wind instrument should be doing, right? And it really wasn't trained for that. Um, so you basically have two parts of the orchestra trying to do two different tasks simultaneously, and that makes the music terrible. Or um, are you just trying to make the percussion section play two different scores, right? Um, creating a bottleneck. And, and, and the neuroscience now is pretty clear. You basically create a bottleneck. So your prefrontal cortex is working harder to try to do two things at once, which we can't do. We, we really don't ever multitask. We're serially monotasking. But either way, you're straining your prefrontal cortex because you're task switching constantly, 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 constantly. And that's what wears it out. And that's what leads to a lot of the problems that I talk about in the book. You mentioned, when I asked you, you mentioned the word boredom, and yes. this captured my attention, perhaps. As you know, I was waiting for the delayed bus, which is why I was slightly late, and I found <laughs> myself having nothing to do. And so I pulled out my phone before realizing, no, I should listen to what Carl said and I should be proactive. But we have learned to manage boredom as well as other uncomfortable feelings using what you said or I'll refer to what you, uh, I'll quote you in the book, inexhaustible vehicles of emotional arousal <laughs> as a form of mood regulator. Even though paradoxically, we know that this often leads to negative moods. You know, I'm not the only one who could report that after use of social media, sometimes I even feel worse, I feel lonelier. And I was wondering what implications might this have on our mental and physical states? The fact that we eradicate whole moments of boredom. Why is boredom necessary for us? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I think there's sort of uh, two answers to that. One is um, what we and what we found in, in our research is that by never allowing ourselves to be bored, and by boredom here I mean kind of in a low aroused state, right? So what we're really doing is we're constantly arousing ourselves and stimulating ourselves, um, and and what happens is you you lose 
uh, and bear with me here, you lose the dynamic range of real emotions, right? So if real emotions go like this, and we're like this all the time because we're constantly jumping from the next thing and trying to search for that next bit of titillation. Um, you can imagine that starts to constrain our physiology and our neurobiology in a way that that could lead to uh, a flattening of emotion, a lowering of mood. And that's what leads to depression in some people and other people leads to anxiety because you're just always on, 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 on. And we've seen uh, in other people it leads to attention deficit problems. Right. And we've certainly seen even before the pandemic, double digit increases uh, in ADHD, anxiety, depression uh, across almost every age group, um, which only got worse during COVID because we were socially distancing, not a great turn of phrase. Um, and uh, we were all on more screens. Uh, most of us were on more screens than, than, than ever. Um, so number one, you start to sort of flatten things out and you're sort of suppressing your, your natural um, variation in your mood and, and you're, you're seeking out um, unnatural rewards. And that's one of the other problems here, right? So, so when, you, when you start to get, and this leads to a conversation about habits versus addiction very quickly, but when you start to substitute the natural rewards of human social interaction or watching a sunset or looking at a flower or enjoying nature, um, with the artificial rewards of, you know, constant uh, stimulation, um, it, it's hard to compete. Uh, and, and we start to substitute. And that's what then starts to uh, uh, make our prefrontal cortex uh, essentially, you know, less activated and less able to, to sort of give that kind of uh, emotional range that leads to the, the problems we talked about. I guess... Um, in your talk, just diverging a bit, you mentioned correlational studies, and I've noticed that most of the studies in the book are correlational because inevitably you cannot but rely on correlational studies. Just for reference, uh, correlation studies are ones that examine factor X and factor Y, and they see if there's any form of linkage without necessarily establishing a causation factor where factor X causes factor Y. And you mentioned that one of the limitations, even though nonetheless, it's, you know, there are ways to deal with the limitation with statistical ways, but you cannot tell, for instance, whether is it that multitasking or excessive use of media is what leads to attention deficit or the rising rates of ADHD, or is it the people with ADHD or poor control that are more willing or perhaps more inclined to multitask. And I guess along those lines, I want to entertain this idea where you mentioned that social media leads to loneliness. And this is really an epidemic on multi-scales. You mentioned how basically a person's life expectancy is directly correlated to the degree of loneliness. And I was wondering, just to play the devil's advocate, is it possible that perhaps people would resort to social media because they are lonely? And I'm just remembering the figures where during the pandemic, even though there were strict rules that differ from one country to another about going out, the use of social media, for instance, dating apps actually skyrocketed. And I was wondering, even though we know such relationships are superficial, is it, could it be possible that we could resort to such social media because we're lonely? Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, and there's a few things to unpack there. As you, as you say, correlation is not causation. And I say that multiple times throughout the books. However, uh, when you start to see trends across multiple domains, multiple types of studies, all converging on the same outcome, uh, you, you, you start to wonder. Um, the other thing, and I try to go out of my way in addition to the correlational studies, find um, carefully controlled studies where you randomize groups and then you look for an effect. So the one that uh, jumps to my mind uh, that, that I thought was quite compelling was um, if you look at childhood um, obesity, um, they did an intervention in California where they randomized two schools to either uh, young kids getting an intervention uh, around screen time um, and their outcome measure was weight gain. And it was interesting that the school that got the intervention, um, as opposed to just you know nutritional information for parents, that was the control group, um, they actually had less weight gain by watching uh, less screen time, by having fewer media consumption. And then you go into laboratory and you can do studies where you show kids um, and, and adults programming, same program, 
and you add food advertisement to one program and the other one does not have food advertising. And at the end, you put a bowl of chips or M&Ms and the group that's exposed to the food advertising eats more of that, uh, eats more food at the end. So now you start to say, okay, well, that's not correlation. That, that looks like it's starting to be causative. And then when you can find a neurobiological or physiologic reason for that, and other elegant studies have shown what happens is when we distract ourselves, particularly around food and calorie intake, uh, is kids in particular, but adults too, make poor choices, right? So you grab salty, fatty snacks. And our satiety centers, the parts of the brain that says, hey, I'm full, I should stop, are distracted by the content. So they overeat. Right, and this is uh, one of the great findings that I think uh, of of this literature, uh, and I highlight this in the book. For years, we thought kids were gaining weight because they weren't exercising so much because they were watching TV. Turns out, kids exercise just the same amount, no matter how much media they consume. They're making bad food choices. Well, now you can do an intervention. Right now, you can work on that. In terms of loneliness, I think it's a, an excellent example. The trends in society predate. Uh, the internet and predate um, the the smartphone. Uh, you know, so people were starting to uh, uh, live uh, alone longer, uh, and as as actually as income went up and people could afford their own places, and people started to spread out as society. Um, however, it did accelerate during uh, the the internet age and the digital age, and uh, it's lasting longer. So you have a higher disproportionately higher numbers of people describing themselves as lonely. Um, and we have a substitute, right? So instead of being like, oh, I'm lonely, I should go out and, and see some people. I don't have to because I have this thing, which then spirals into all the patterns uh, we sort of talk about. And, and there's one study I want to mention around loneliness that I thought was quite compelling. Um, I believe it was out of MIT, but they basically took uh, a group of people age matched who were lonely and who weren't lonely, and then showed them a bunch of photographs of just people's faces doing various things and expressions. And they did something interesting. They digitized all of the images to the point where you could barely even tell it was a human. So you have a normal photograph and then all points in between to a point where it's almost unrecognizable. And then they randomly sorted them and showed them to people and had them rate very simply on a scale of one to 10, how human do you think this, this photograph looks? And the people who are lonely rated the digitized images as more human. And so I took that as a kind of sad commentary that the lonelier we get, the more uh, we kind of uh, dehumanize um, ourselves in a way and our ability to, to, to take in information in the world. Yeah, actually jumping on that note, you reminded me of another study, ironically at MIT. I remember it because it was done when I was there and the, my friends participated in it. The results were ironically published during the pandemic, where they basically took a group of students, healthy people, they put them in groups, sorry, they put them in rooms where there was nothing to do for 10 hours. And then they took them out and they basically scanned their brains. And basically they found out that the same areas of the brain that get activated when craving for food during hunger actually get activated when craving for social connection. And the longer you deprive people from social connection, or perhaps people who report to be more lonelier, those cravings become less pronounced in the brains. In other words, positive social connections are a basic human need, just like, you know, craving for food or just st straying away from any states of danger. A hundred percent. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. It's to build on that. Um, we'll go back to our conversation about, you know, using media as a mood regulator, right? Prior yeah. to the existence of, of mass media, what do we do? We, we connect with one another. We told stories around a campfire, right? You know, so for a million years of evolution, we depended on each other for mood regulation and emotion regulation. And now we're, we're, we're using, you know, technology. Um, how can that not have an impact, right? So sometimes you sort of zoom out and just say, like, what did we expect, <laughs> right? I was hoping you could elaborate a bit more on, first of all, on mood regulation. Um, perhaps you could tell us more, what does that mean for the audience? Yeah, so if you um, look at, say, uh, a mother looking uh, and interacting with her infant, uh, uh, or you look at a couple in love, or even good friends having a conversation, or even, you know, you and I, right, we did one prep call, and now we're talking, um, and you can code our body language, you can use our physiology, uh, our peripheral physiology, we can use our brain physiology. You can do all kinds of different metrics and find these patterns where there's a certain amount of synchrony happening between us. And, and it ebbs and flows, right? We're not 
perfectly in, in sync all the time. Uh, sometimes we are, sometimes we aren't. And that's just sort of how, you know, human brains transmit information. Um, and it's not dissimilar to, to you know, I always, uh, I sometimes ask, you know, people, how many people have a, a dog or a cat? And lots of people raise their hand and say, okay, does your dog or cat um, have emotions? You know, yes or no. And most people raise their hand and say, yes, yes, of course they do. Uh, why? Well, because they have similar brain structures as we do in the subcortex. And they have a neocortex and a prefrontal cortex, smaller one than we do, you know, and developmentally, uh, you know, a smart dog is probably about the same developmental emotional stage as about a three or four year old, which is a really fun age and why, you know, they're great pets, right? Um, because they can, they can understand our emotional world and we can understand theirs to some degree and we connect with them and we bond with them. Um, and they're, they're important parts of our lives, right? You know, so, so there's a physiology and a neurobiology to this, this emotional world that, that gives color, gives inspiration, gives rise to cooperation, you know, all the things that we value in society. Um, however, you know, uh, and this is where we should probably talk a little bit about habits versus addiction. Um, yeah. When the rewards that drive that emotional uh, connection um, come from something else, right? The, the, the extreme examples of addiction with the alcohol what's that sorry for the interruption but yeah. could you perhaps first of all uh, just very briefly yeah. tell us what's the difference if any between a habit and addiction are they just oh. different nomenclature to refer to the same thing on like the opposite sides of the spectrum or do they actually have separate physiological or emotional implications or uh, yeah, it's a great, great question and an important question because I, I, I wouldn't want to take that for granted, right? So, so habits um, are certain uh, repeated behaviors uh, that we do mostly on a non-conscious level, meaning we're not aware that we're doing them to create efficiency for our brain, right? The example I always use is, you know, driving a car for the first time or learning to drive a car or learning to ride a bicycle, right? There's a lot of different steps that you have to go through in a car, right? You know, where's the gas, where's the brake, where are you turning on, you know, indicators, mirrors, lights, all that stuff that you really have to think about. But over time, you get in the car and it's just like, boom, car's on and we're, we're in gear and we're off. But how did we do that? But right? there's a great example of how the brain, a particular brain called a part of the brain called the striatum can take multiple steps in a process and link them together, almost like a computer code or algorithm into a single action unit, boom, run the tape, right? And that allows us to, to not think about uh, things and frees up brain resources for, for higher order thinking, right? If I had to think about every time I put my foot somewhere or opening a door or turning a light on, imagine how little we would accomplish as, as a species. Um, so, so habits make our brains more efficient. Um, and what's important to your point about the difference between habits and addiction, um, addictions are really habits gone extreme and uh, the behavior tends to be focused on a single reward. Right, so there are lots of things that are rewarding. Like it's it's re it's rewarding to get in the car and, and drive to work as opposed to taking the bus, which is always late. Right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna learn that behavior and I'm gonna get that reward. I'm gonna do it over and over again. But I could put a, I could stop and say, you know what, I'm not gonna drive today. I need to save some money on gas. I'm gonna take the bus, and I can make that decision. That's the prefrontal cortex saying, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a sacrifice here. I'm gonna put the brakes on that. Right now, if I'm addicted to instead of driving to work versus taking the bus, I'm addicted to cocaine or heroin or alcohol. I'm just going to go get that over and over again. And, and, and the reward delta of a, uh, of a drug like cocaine, heroin, uh, drugs and alcohol is, is on the order of 100x um, what you know, something that drives a habit would be. So these are powerful emotional rewards. And what we know from the neuroscience is that the prefrontal cortex cannot compete Right, with the reward centers when they are powerfully addicted to these substances. Now, the big and interesting debate in the literature is up until recently, there was only one behavior that was classified as an addiction uh, and it was gambling, okay. right? So people could pa be pathological gamblers where the reward is you know, the slot machine or, or, or poker or whatever that was so powerful that people would do it to the exclusion of friends, to the exclusion of uh, work, to the exclusion of other things uh, and, and could lead to bad outcomes. I tell the story in the book of uh, Lee Sung Sup, uh, this uh, Korean video game player who played for 48 hours straight and uh, forgot to eat and drink uh, and died of cardiac arrest from playing video games too long. It makes you think, you know, 
technically, I don't know, according to the psychiatry definition or diagnosis, perhaps this would not, gaming might not form a part of addiction, but the reality is that is prefrontal, like the reward systems basically was, were so overwhelming that, you know, he forget to like tailor for his own basic premises of need, like, like basic human needs of eating, drinking, defecating. And, you know, you mentioned this, this is an extreme example, but the reality is that all of us more or less indulge perhaps on a lower level in some form of repeated behavior. And we are, we indulge in it until like a level we are no longer capable of basically gauging what our mind and body really need, just as in the case of this first uh, Korean person you mentioned, which brings me to another point. You know, this is a person, um, if I remember correctly, you mentioned in the book that he was going through perhaps compromised social relationships and people already noticed this behavior, but then he decided to resort to um, gaming addiction online. And it makes me think about how such forms of digital media basically hit the people who are most vulnerable, which brings me to perhaps one of the last questions before we open to the Q&A, which is predispositions. Yes. Um, you mentioned in your book various predispositions, such as socioeconomic, you know, perhaps less than $30,000 uh, families of income. They don't use much of technology, but higher than that, we start noticing certain trends. For instance, people, families of lower income tend to be less, tend to be more engaged in digital media and less aware of the repercussions. Also, you suggest some form of risk assessment, like you suggest that the risk assessment should basically entail some form of stratification based on the patient's history or like the person's history, whether he has depression, we have, whether he has trauma. And I was wondering, why is it that we have differing trends among people depending on socioeconomic status or uh, physical and mental health? And why is it that some people are capable of moderation than others with the full knowledge that we have the same reward system baked in our physiology, the same reward system that the, you know, the tech people are trying to hack or hijack, basically. Yes, Ali, it's a terrific question. So, um, you know, and, and all roads lead to the prefrontal cortex, right? So if you look at um, socioeconomic status, right? So we now know uh, that children uh, who are raised in poverty actually have different brains than children who are raised in wealth. Um, and part of that brain structure is their, their hippocampus is smaller. So the area where they um, form memories and learn um, and areas of their prefrontal cortex surprisingly, um, are less connected to their uh, emotion centers. Uh, adverse events, right? So otherwise healthy uh, kids who have to go through maybe a high conflict divorce or have trauma at an early age or uh, physical or sexual abuse, you, you name it, um, their brains are going to be compromised. Um, people who have mental illness at an early age, whether it's depression, anxiety, ADHD, whatever the cause, we know that their brains are compromised. So I, I think one of the takeaways of the book is that we're all vulnerable. We are all changing our habits, uh, but we're not all addicted. Um, and some of us are at higher risk than others. And those who are at higher risk are those who already have a predisposition, among which I just described some risk factors. But that doesn't mean you can't take, you know, people uh, as, as educated as you, who I presume had a pretty healthy and, and enriching uh, environment growing up and, and still not get into a little bit of trouble, you know, yeah. with, uh, you know, angry birds or, uh, what, or social media or, uh, or online pornography. You know, I, you, you know, I have this little section in the book about the epidemic of uh, erectile dysfunction in yeah. adolescent males. I was shocked when I saw this, like, these are, these are young boys who are otherwise healthy right? Their vascular system yeah. is fine. Their brains are fine. And they can't get an erection when they're with an attractive woman of the opposite sex that they should normally get an erection to because they spend too much time uh, watching pornography on, on high-speed internet. Wow. That's interesting. They're rewiring their brain, right? In, in, a, in a fundamental way, just like the TikTok ticks um, are another, I think, you know, we, we talked about correlation and causation. This is causation. Right. So, so this is after the book. It's not in my book. I wish, I wish it was before, but you know, it was during the pandemic. There was a network of movement disorder clinics in North America uh, that started to report some unusual ticks. And they were unusual because tick disorder, Tourette's, classically is in young boys, age three to five. And each tick is unique um, and, and they evolve over time. 
These were young women who were teenagers and they all had the same tick. And that tick looked like a movement that was on TikTok. So literally by watching short videos, they were developing a movement disorder on a massive scale through consuming social media. Now, if that's not causation, I don't know what is. No. Um, I am conscious of the time. I wanted to ask a few questions about these snackable forms of amateur video, but I guess we could postpone that to the Q&A. I guess before we open to the Q&A, I want to perhaps open for some form of a message of hopes and tips, you know, mm. whether we like it or not, social media and digital connections have become so pervasive that we cannot live without them. You know, as I might have mentioned, just to log in this, I had to basically have my phone to go through the duo factor authentication, which I think Oxford should get rid of, but that's not the left because it's most of the time it doesn't work. And um, I remember perhaps social activities posted within the college, you know, they tell us, oh, they're posted on Facebook or they're posted on WhatsApp. Or even if you go out on dates, they ask for your Instagram handle on the presumption yeah. that you need those. Yeah. I've read this statistic that up to one fourth of partnerships nowadays start from online dating. And, you know, the numbers could even go higher with, for instance, LGBTQ people where like conventional forms of matching are compromised, for instance. And mm -hmm. this is alarming. The reality is that if we put such forms of communication aside, we are missing out. So what are your tips on leading a healthy life? As you know, as you've mentioned, Sigmund uh, Freud, he describes a healthy life as one with love and work. And we know both of these are compromised due to social media. So how can one lead a healthy life, but without missing out? First of all, I have to comment that I was snickering when you mentioned two-factor identification, logging <laughs> into a computer. So you're using your phone to log into a computer to get on the internet to talk on Zoom to me from Oxford to Boston. Um, when I was at Oxford in 1991, there were like three people on email, right? And we still <laughs> used we still use the pigeon post where we would write little letters and and you'd have to wait three days to send a message. Um, unfortunately, and, the pigeon or fortunately the pigeon holes are still there, but <laughs> they're still there. Nobody uses them. Nobody uses them. Yeah, well, there, there you go. That's it was it was the technology of the day. Um, and, you know, and it worked and it was frustratingly slow sometimes. Um, look, we, we evolve. I'm not against technology. I'm sitting in front of three screens right now talking to you. Right. And um, this is really and I, I, I love technology and there's a tremendous number of benefits. Um, it's really about tech life balance. And, and so when we get to the, uh, as I was going through and writing this book, I was starting to get myself depressed, right? Because there's just a lot of bad news here. I said, well, what could we offer for hope? Um, and I had this, this pretty simple idea, which is that, well, if, if what we're seeing here is a pattern of, of really assaulting the prefrontal cortex from all different directions with all kinds of new behaviors and technologies, all we really need to do is protect it and, and, and build it up. So what can we do to give resiliency to the prefrontal cortex so that we can begin to not fall into the, the make our habits turn into addictions and not have the, the divisiveness and the depression um, and the distraction that we're all susceptible to. So in the final section of the book, uh, the third section of the book, uh, I give 10 recommendations uh, for essentially, you know, uh, that are all science-based and designed to give your prefrontal cortex a little bit of lift, right? So, so, so let's talk about a couple, right? The first one is, you know, stop multitasking, right? So if you, if you want to be, you know, I, if you were to say to me, he's like, um, you know, Dr. Marcy, what is the key takeaway of your book? It's like, well, you know, here's the internet pitch, right? You want to be smarter, have better relationships and be more productive at work, right? Read my book. And that means just stop multitasking. Or you just do those three things uh, and, and, and follow the other, some of these other rules, you're going to be better off, right? So, so serial monotasking, right? When you're at work, turn all the notifications off, put your phone away, focus for an hour uh, and, 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 and get some work done. And you'll feel better, you'll be more productive, and you won't be as exhausted at the end of the day. And you mentioned it doesn't happen in a single day. You know, it requires continuous effort and continuous consciousness, being proactive. And you will fall, you know, we've all fallen. That's right. uh, Habits don't all form overnight. Of, I'm <laughs> going to delete this app. I'm never going to use it again. And a few days later, you use it again. Right. So it's a That's continuous right. process of reevaluation. 
and, and and that you have to be intentional about it right and so in the book i talk about like all the different things you can do to sort of help yourself achieve this not trivial task by the way um you know choose jomo over fomo right the joy of missing out versus the fear of missing out so rather than you know driving to social media to make sure you're not missing anything say look you know i'm going to enjoy and get reward from something outside of social media and be intentional about that and realize that social media for the most part is a is a sea of disinformation highly curated uh, images activities and posts um, that that really uh, have nothing to do with friendship um, and have everything to do with trying to hack your brain to get you to come back and, and do more mm -hmm. uh, as just two examples I think you know the, the last one jumping to the number 10 and then we'll do some questions um, you know arguably is the most important I think which is you know learn to meditate and do more exercise right so so meditation has been shown over and over and over again in different studies to actually build up the prefrontal cortex in a way that's actually an antidote to all of the insults we're talking about and think about what meditation requires no screens right turn everything more on, down close your eyes focus inside right it's sustained con concentration really trying to emotionally handle your own regulation, right? You're self-regulating. Um, and that's what sort of builds up the prefrontal cortex. Exercise, interestingly, tamps down the reward system and gives your reward system, right? The neurotransmitters and, and, and releases what's called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that actually makes your neurons more resilient. So they can handle stress better and do more things. So if you just do those two things, um, you're, you're going to be you're going to be in much better shape. I guess for the enthusiastic readers who want to learn more about the tips, well, you can. That's right. The other eight or the other. I think now it's a good point to move to the Q and A. I'm not sure what's the optimal way to do it. You could either post your question on in the chat, or you could also raise your hand, and I'll try to find you and. You could unmute yourself in that case and ask the yeah, question. Don't, don't be shy. Okay, we have a question from Mahdi. Do you want to unmute yourself? Hi. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the talk. It's been fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask about, uh, so you talk about mood regulators, the crisis being that mood regulators have gone from social interactions to smartphones in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering the area in between, what the effect of other antidotes to boredom or loneliness, like reading, writing, hobbies, yeah. on a neurological, physiological level, what the effect of those types of distractions are, how they fare against going on your smartphone. Yeah, a great question, right? So another recommendation is choose paper over pixels as an example, right? So what do I mean, right? So again, uh, for deep learning uh, and to give your prefrontal cortex, you know, some, some healthy uh, exercise, uh, you, you actually want to read you know, the paperback version of my book versus the digital version of my book. Why? Well, um, there's a lot of things that, that go into uh, the, the physicality. It's called haptics uh, of, a, of a book or even a, a manuscript, right? That it's got thickness. You're turning the page. You can see your progression. You're interacting with it. Um, and uh, it turns out that ink on paper has much finer contrast and, and harder edges that make it easier for the eyes to accommodate and fixate. Whereas looking at a screen because of the LEDs and the light, um, your eyes are actually constantly strained. Even like the, there's been studies and I cite some of these in the book in terms of blink rate. Right? So we blink more when we're, when we're looking at paper and that keeps our eyes fresh. We don't get as strained um, and we don't have uh, all the side effects. So nothing to do with social interaction here. It's just like, if you have a choice between reading something and you know, printing it out and like I'm all for the environment and saving trees too, but you know, there's a balance here that, that uh, you, know, you wanna you know, read things, recycle books, things like that um, for learning. That, that's just one e example of, uh, you know, something that you can do to sort of, again, help your, help your brain that has nothing to do with social interaction. Does that make sense? All right, cool. We have another question from Louise. Is that correct? Um, this is Karina. That's, that's Louise. Um, yeah. so, uh, my question is that um, we should probably say do more exercise or like 
do some meditation to like help protect our brain. Are there things that we absolutely should not do? For example, I read this like study about people who play the game Pokemon pretty often have one region of the brain dedicated to only playing Pokemon. So like, I wonder like, are there like things, activities we do like video games, a sector that will cause kind of irreversible, we could call it damage or harm to the brain that we just like should not do. Yeah, so you get quickly into a conversation about video games, right? And uh, I actually wrote uh, uh, you know, 80 pages on video games that ended up on the editing floor um, because it's so complicated a part. So I sprinkle anecdotes and some bits about video games throughout the book. Uh, it's an incredibly complicated topic because each game is unique and different, right? What do we know? Well, we know a couple of things. One thing is that um, there are some games that actually do hone focus uh, and there's a handful of studies that show, for example, uh, physicians who do stereotactic surgery. So they're looking at a screen and they have to think in three dimensions who play a certain type of video game are actually you know, better than those who don't. Now, again, correlation causation, hard to say, um, but there are other studies, you know, brain training. I mean, the, the, the world is now littered with brain training games, right? To try to improve ADHD, treat depression and other things. Um, and there's some really compelling ones out there that, that uh, I've had the privilege of screening and, and uh, you know, been asked to invest in over time. So I think we're getting to a place where hopefully in the future, we'll be able to have some kind of star rating for video games that says, look, you know, healthy to non-healthy or here's what you could take away from it. Um, the other thing we know uh, is that violent video games absolutely increase the risk for uh, microaggressions and, and, and the way kids who spend a lot of time doing violent video games um, frame violence. Now, it doesn't lead to, you know, people going into schools and, and shooting kids. That's a whole other phenomenon. Um, but there's no question uh, the violent video game literature is pretty robust um, in that uh, you have to be really careful with kids who play in isolation. Now, what's interesting is there's an exception to that, right? Kids who play violent video games with other kids in the room socially, actually that acts as a bit of an antidote. So if you add a real social component and you're actually emotionally regulating with another person, you can offset some of the aggressive tendency, which I think is a wonderful example that proves the point. All right. Um, just before quickly before moving into the two questions, um, an alarming word that was mentioned, which is irreversibility. And I just want I do have a really quick irreversibility. Yeah, that. I was wondering, you know, for our tech savvy Gen Z out there, which I'm guilty of, you mentioned to talk about neuroplasticity. And I was wondering what are your notions or thoughts about the irreversibility of people who have already and this is applicable to both my age and adults, to people who have yeah. already misused their prefrontal cortex, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I mean, irreversibility is a big word. Uh, I, I think there's hope for everyone. Right? We, you know, when I was uh, your age, Ali, you know, I was taught, you know, you know, you get so many neurons uh, up until your early adulthood, and that's it. Um, and then they die off over time. And well, it turns out we were wrong. Uh, and neurogenesis happens throughout our lives, particularly in the hippocampus, which is an area for memory. So we're, we're constantly sprouting new neurons. Now they die very quickly if we don't use them, right? So, um, so neuroplasticity is that we, will, we can and should make new connections uh, as we learn. And neurogenesis, we can form new neurons that give us uh, brain growth. Um, so, so the good news is we're all capable of brain change. Um, the other good news is you look at... Uh, uh, what's in the pipeline from a psychopharmacological perspective. You know, people may have heard of uh, uh, psilocybin, which is uh, the magic pharmaceutical grade magic mushrooms, um, you know, which go back to the 60s and Timothy Leary. Uh, well, uh, so, so part of my work is involved in companies who are building these things. You know, there's, some, there's something potentially magical about, about these things. And it looks like from a neurobiology perspective, you can actually get the brain to go back to an earlier state, a pre-addictive state, at least temporarily. And, and that's essentially using pharmaceuticals to rewire your brain back to a healthier version. And then through therapy and other things, we could potentially begin to get people back on the right track. I would prefer to prevent all that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I think there's, uh, look, in 10, 20 years from now, there's gonna be whole therapies dedicated to this. There's gonna be new technologies, hopefully you know, pharmaceuticals. Um, and, and just more awareness. So um, I, I think there is hope, but you know, just like anything, you know, prevention is, is uh, 
worth a, uh, you know, is worth a lot because um, it's it's easier to prevent sometimes than it is to fix. Sounds good. Um, I I believe Wakithi or Wakihi has a question. You could go ahead. Uh, hi, <clears throat> uh, thank hi. you so much, Carl and Ali, for this amazing, fascinating uh, discussion. Um, you've raised so many great points, which are all important. Um, I'd read something somewhere about how um, happiness or like joy was closely linked to the quality of your relationships that you are able to build in life. And um, for the longest time, um, you know, I wouldn't have, you know, believed this specific situation or scenario being possible. But for example, um, this year, one of my most most significant social interactions was born of social media. And I, I, I just wouldn't have expected that to have been possible. Um, and knowing, you know, that happiness is related to the quality of your social, social interactions. Um, so my question is like, how, what parts of social media if we're really trying to go through with a, with a fine tooth comb, what can we pick out um, that is useful if, we try, mm -hmm. if we're trying to be discerning about it? Um, because it's quite hard to like completely go off it. Like breaks yep. are good, you know, moderated use is good. Yep. But yeah. Well, I, well Keithy, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up, right? So there's two points, and this is a nice probably way to end the hour. Um, I, I think uh, number one, again, I'm not against technology, I'm not against social media, but to your point, how do you use it to get the most benefit, right? right? So if you're sharing information with loved ones or people who are in that 150 number, you know, true friends uh, or relationships, um, you know, who are at a distance and there's no other way to communicate with them uh, or that it's a very efficient way to communicate with them, perfectly reasonable. If you're using social media to, to organize, to, to meet up face-to-face, um, and do something that's off of screens, fantastic. Um, if you're sharing, you know, actual truthy information, um, good. You know, one of the other recommendations in the book is think before you post. Think is an acronym, right? T, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it important? You know, N, is it necessary? K, is it kind? Right? And it comes from a high school in the Midwest who posted this because kids were just doing awful things online. The problem with online and, and, and some of the negativity around it is there's no consequences or the consequences are so far, right? Like if you or I are walking down the hall and I said, hey, asshole, right? You looked at me and sort of pushed me back. And, you know, in the old days, we'd have a little brawl and the principal would separate us and, you know, that would be it. Now I'd say, hey, asshole online. And you're like, I can't do anything. So I'd say, hey, asshole back. Next thing you know, we're in this thing and it's, like, it's a complete waste of time, right? So, so I think that, uh, you know, if, if we look at social media through the lens of the social part, not the media part, Right, I, I think it can be a, a source for good. And then to your point about happiness and relationships, uh, wonderful studies by a guy named Bob Waldinger who happens to be a friend and colleague at Mass General. Um, he is the third director of the Harvard Longitudinal Study that goes back to the 30s. So he has studied people for decades and has a new book out, uh, which I recommend called The Good Life. And it, it's exactly probably what you're quoting, which is, you know, uh, what he finds after decades is that uh, what people care most about and what leads to the most amount of happiness is, is, is the quality and, and number of relationships uh, in their lives. And that shouldn't be surprising based on everything we, we've been sort of talking about here, right? And that's why another recommendation in the book is, you know, choose strong bonds over, over weak bonds, right? Prioritize the connections with, with people that matter. And look, if you found a friend or a relationship through social media, fantastic, right? What's the difference between that and meeting someone on a street corner? It doesn't matter how you connect as long as uh, the core of that connection is, you know, more intimate and, and physiologically based. As long as it translates in real life. I don't know if we have time for one more question. Uh, Georgie, do we have time for one more question? Well, that's up to... waiting. I can hang on, sure, yeah. All right, I think, I think we have room for one more question from Gemma. Hi, Carl. Thank you so much. This was absolutely fascinating. I haven't read your book. I'm going to admit that first, and I've already ordered it. So, um... Terrific, thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to find out more. I mean, you haven't really mentioned it, but I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts on this um, beyond. So, so just the effects of, of what we've been chatting about and, and our sleep um, ah. beyond kind of, you know, looking at a screen before bed and, and, and the, you know, the, yeah. what we already know, or, you know, what at least I know 
Um, just, yeah, if you have anything more to say about, about Yeah, I think it's recommendation number seven, right? Do not bring technology into the bedroom, right? So uh, I, 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 I'm a psychiatrist. I treat a lot of insomnia and, and we talk about sleep hygiene, right? And so sleep hygiene is just things that are important, right? The, the, the brain likes to go to bed and get up at the same time every day, including weekends. And that's really hard for young people, but it's so important. Um, you know, no caffeinated beverages or food or anything stimulating, you know, after a certain hour of the day, because it's going to, you know, get in the way of things, you know, lower the lights, uh, have a bedtime routine, um, and absolutely no screens uh, in, in the bedroom, uh, you know, read, read a book, read a magazine. Um, but people are like, like patients who have televisions in the room to get it out of there. Why? Because A, it's stimulating, right? It's designed, as we said, to stimulate your emotions. And before you go to bed, you want the opposite. You want to kind of turn down, right? Your, your arousal. And two, the, the screens emit a, a form of blue light that sends a signal to the uh, pineal gland, which is a part of the brain that looks at light that says, hey, it's daytime, time to wake up when it's actually nighttime and you should be going to sleep, right? So you, so you start to release cortisol and decrease melatonin and the opposite should be sort of happening. And, and there are companies out there that are promoting glasses and filters and other things you could do to the screen. I haven't seen a single study showing that, that any of that works. And the reason this matters uh, is that sleep is so important for our brain and our prefrontal cortex. Right. So people who are chronically sleep deprived, uh, we know are at higher risk. It's another one of these vulnerabilities we talked about earlier um, that, uh, you know, trouble sleeping uh, sets up all, all kinds of issues. So it's just a it's a great question. We have to sleep. Um, don't be a hero. You know, go to bed, get some rest and, and keep the screens. And you know, my favorite is when young people are like, well, I use my phone as an alarm clock. Yeah, for like eight dollars, you can get an alarm clock uh, that that you can put by your bed. You don't you don't need to use your phone. Uh, and parents too, collect those phones uh, from your kids before they go to bed, particularly teenagers, because they'll be up all night, and then they're taking uh, energy drinks and caffeine all day and stimulants, and and then the cycle sort of goes from there. And and you can imagine what that does to the adolescent brain. Yeah, thank you. I mean, Carl refers to multiple topics, including bedtime hygiene and the effect on sleep in his book. Of course, I could not talk about everything mentioned in the book. Um, so if you're keen to learn yeah, more, we could talk for hours, right? Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Carl, for your time. This was a Thanks really good question. discussion. I've personally really enjoyed reading the book. As I said, there were parts that were alarmist, but nonetheless very necessary. And, you know, it sensitized me to many of the habits that I do have and I know there's a long way to go, but at least you know the first step is acknowledgement, as you said. And That's I right. hope this book is also gonna be a source of guidance to many of the people out there, including the people who joined this discussion. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, everyone. And thank you for the great audience too. Mm -hmm.